pulsar helium, as the name suggests, it is all about helium. So we look for helium that is not associated with hydrocarbons. So 95% of the world's current helium production is a byproduct of hydrocarbons. We aim to change that. It's a very new industry, uh, about 10 years old. And it's really uh, brought about by the shortage in helium, which has now persisted for about 10 years, the increase in the price. And that really uh, validates going off and finding helium as a primary product rather than a byproduct. So, Gilbert, you kindly said that we have this project in Minnesota, our Topaz project. We completed a appraisal drilling program there in February of this year. And we came up with 13.8% helium in the raw gas. What does that mean? Um, so in industry, anything which is 0.3% uh, helium in the raw gas or higher is deemed to be a potential economic significance. So 13.8% is extraordinary. Uh, it really is an incredibly high concentration. And uh, this chart is now out of date. We're actually now positioned as number one uh, in the USA or in North America, indeed, including Canada and Mexico. A um, bit about our company. So we're listed on the TSXV. Uh, we also have uh, the OTCQB as well. Um, so share price, uh, that really increased recently. Uh, on the back of the appraisal well that we drilled in Minnesota, so confirming the discovery there. Um, we currently have, uh, so our, our share, um, well, market capitalization, uh, just over 110 million Canadian. Um, with the warrants that we have on issue, uh, we've just recently uh, announced that there is an accelerator for about 10 million of those. Um, so uh, they now have a couple of weeks left uh, to either be uh, converted into shares or they will expire. And so that tidies up our share registry a little bit and then brings in additional capital for the company as well. So financially, we're actually in a very good position. Uh, the major shareholders in the company, so our single largest shareholder is, is a group out of the Netherlands, AB Crescent. Um, and then the rest of the stock is, is held by, well, 50% roughly by management and founders of the company. Um, so we have a, a you know, a lot of skin in the game. We want this to be a success and we'll do everything in our power to make it a success. Uh, we've also undergone quite a, a heavy escrow arrangement as well. So uh, we only listed in August of last year. Uh, our shares are locked in, uh, well, uh, for no sales for the first 18 months. And then 20% becomes uh, released every uh, six months thereafter. So we're not fully unlocked until after three years after listing. And we hope that shows to everybody just how much belief we have in our company. Who are we? So myself, I'm the president, CEO, co-founder, director, all of the above. Um, but a geologist by background. Uh, and I personally have been in the helium industry for a decade. Uh, Neil Herbert, our chairman, he also has been in the helium industry. So he and I and uh, our technical manager, Josh Blewett, uh, we started up the world's first helium exploration company and uh, then since went on to form uh, Pulsar Helium as well. And then we've got a really strong team with us as well, our independent directors uh, who've got a strong financial but also oil and gas background as well uh, with John Ferrier used to be the CEO of Gulf Keystone Petroleum, which is a petroleum producer in Iraq. Uh, the advantages that we have, uh, like any commodity, grade is king. And so what we have in North America, Topaz, is extremely high grade. Uh, we also have location. Helium is, is very difficult to transport. You want to be close to your market. And the USA is the world's largest market for helium. And that's where we're situated. Uh, the, the, it's a high value product in short supply. Uh, I'll get into details about why, um, but um, it, we're not exposed to any other commodity with helium being the primary economic driver. We really are exposed to that high helium price, which currently exists and has existed for a period of time. So here it is. So with the uh, the pricing of helium, there's two different types of helium. You have helium in a gas form and helium in a liquid form. Uh, liquid helium is the premier product. And what we're seeing now is that uh, you're getting prices in excess of $1,000 per thousand cubic feet. To put that into perspective, natural gas is around four or five dollars for the for the same unit of measurement. Uh, for for uh, helium in a gaseous form, 
it, that's getting pricing of up to about seven hundred dollars as well. So very valuable, but small uh, small volumes. So you can't power cars with helium. You you can't uh, do that. However, it is a, a very uh, strong market which is in 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 demand i guess you could say it's growing so 6.1 billion cubic feet is the market for last year and it's looking to grow up to 8.1 billion cubic feet by 2030 but at the moment we do have that shortage which has persisted for a decade and what we're seeing is that demand is actually curtailed by supply not everybody is getting the allocations of what they uh, aim to purchase and the major reason for that is that U.S. supply, so USA being formerly the world's number one producer of helium, it's in decline. And that's really because of aging gas fields. Uh, so they're not producing uh, at the same rate as they did uh, a few decades ago. So therefore, supply is dwindling. And it's worth noting, too, that not every single natural gas source has helium attached to it. Uh, that they, they are not ubiquitous. So what's happened is, is that the, the gap in supply is now being filled by Qatar in the Middle East on the back of their natural gas production. But one of the inherent risks there is that uh, getting it across uh, to North America is problematic. If you can picture a helium balloon, you have it in your room. A week later, it's a shriveled up thing on the floor. And that's because helium likes to leak. It's a very small atomic size. Same goes with uh, transportation internationally. So as a liquid form in containers, so it gets shipped in 40-foot containers, uh, by the time it eventually reaches the United States, some of that pro product is most likely leaked out. What's it used for? So the big one is uh, for semiconductors. So in the fabrication of semiconductors, you need liquid helium. Uh, the one, other one, big one is MRI scanners. For the magnet to superconduct, you need liquid helium modular helium reactors so these are the new so sort of next generation uh, reactors for energy production need helium uh, for space pro, uh, for space launch uh, if you've seen a rocket there on the, on the launch pad with the gas pouring out the side of it there's a good chance that, that is helium leaking out and that's used as a pressure agent in the fuel tank fiber optic cables hard drives and so it goes on so really, it's a very tech-biased commodity, and it's worth noting that uh, helium balloons is about 3% of market share and a bit of a waste of a very valuable commodity. So digging into what we have, uh, so our, we have two projects, one Topaz in Minnesota in the United States, and then two new in Greenland. Uh, I will focus on Topaz uh, because of the time restraints, but uh, in Greenland, that one there, we identified internally a primary helium product uh, project and that one is uh, looking at uh, towards the European Union because they are heavily reliant on imports of uh, helium from abroad, uh, whereas uh, Topaz is definitely focused on the US market. So we're in northern Minnesota, and uh, we're, we're just uh, to the north of a place called Duluth, which is a, a major city uh, and a regional hub for, uh, for primarily for iron ore production. So the, most of the United States iron ore production occurs in northern Minnesota, very near to our project. And on the right-hand side, that's a picture of where the helium was identified. So location is everything. So we are situated right next to those iron ore mines with all the infrastructure that you would anticipate being there. So there's roads, there's electricity, but then also you've got access to the Great Lakes. So we're very close to Lake Superior uh, and a very skilled workforce as well. So without uh, looking at any foreign labor, uh, is that uh, everything that is already in place there. Um, in terms of exports of helium in a potential uh, production scenario, uh, it is all exported by truck. It's not by pipelines, it's by truck. So it's 40-foot containers of liquid helium, and so then it go onto the road network, and then, you know, within a you know, maximum distance in the contiguous United States, you're looking at maximum two days' uh, time to get to site. So you don't have any uh, concerns about loss of product. Um, so location is extremely important. The discovery itself, so this project was actually identified back in 2011. Um, so a company at the time, which is not us, um, they were out there looking for nickel and platinum. And so they were drilling down one day. They got to about 1,800 feet or 540 meters. And then they hit, unexpectedly, they hit gas. 
And uh, what it did was it it, was, it blew out the uh, the core that you can see in the picture there. About uh, nine feet of that blew out of the ground uh, from 1,800 feet up to surface and then out into the air like a projectile. Uh, the gas was under extremely high pressure. Uh, the the, uh, the drill crew was very concerned that the gas would be combustible. So they took samples, sent it to two different laboratories and found out it was not combustible, but was extremely high concentration helium, 10.5%. Um, at the time, uh, you know, helium wasn't really on the radar, so they walked away, uh, and we then were able to come in and take the, the project over. Um, what have we done since then? So there was a discovery made, but without any of the lead-up data. Uh, so in the past couple of years, we've been collecting things like passive seismic data, uh, magnetic data, gravity data, to find out, is this an isolated occurrence, or is it something larger? Uh, and then that culminated in February uh, with drilling the appraisal well, which you can see in the photo there, which is located about 50 feet away from the original discovery. We went deeper than the discovery. We used a proper gas rig. And uh, what we found is that uh, the, actually the helium concentration increased up to 13.8%. And um, that uh, we, we found that the, uh, the zone of interest uh, was from that sort of 1750 down to 2200 feet depth is where we found that that's where the helium was entering the well. Uh, so quite a broad zone there. And now we're going to be doing additional testing, which will be happening in the next couple of weeks, which will be telling us the flow rates uh, and then the pressure buildup, which will give us an idea of the size of the reservoir. Uh, also worth noting that we have the exclusive mineral rights. Um, so we're on private land, private mineral rights. And that we're, as the first mover there, we've consolidated our position in Minnesota. And so we're very comfortable that we have the area of interest uh, secured. Um, the seismic survey. So this one's really important. So um, what we have here in this section is you can see that the drill hole is located there. And at the bottom of the drill hole, you then enter this green zone, the green blob as it's currently being referred to as. What that indicates is a velocity step change. So seismic is, you know, these waves going through the ground. And we find that there's a, a velocity decrease um, in, in that green area. And that coincides with where the gas uh, starts to enter the well. So that shows that the perspective zone is very broad. Uh, it extends off to the west, to the north, and also to the south. It's open. So what we're looking at here, we, we believe, is not just an isolated occurrence, but actually, which is something quite regionally extensive. So much so that we know that there was a, a hole drilled off about 100 miles off to the southwest, and that hole was not targeting helium, but it did hit gas, and it came back with 2% helium, which in itself is an extremely high concentration. So we're not looking at something which is isolated. We think it's something which is quite large that we've got. Um, so future work will be then, you know, going to test uh, the extent of this and the true size. But really, in terms of the the news flow that we have coming up, uh, it's that we get the additional data from the well that we've drilled. So that'll be in the next few weeks. We then give all the information that we have off to our independent resource calculator, uh, a group called Sprule, uh, the D uh, Denver office. Uh, they will then do a, an updated resource calculation. And uh, should that look positive, uh, then we would move to the next step, which is then looking at a, a feasibility study and what would any production scenarios look like and how soon could we potentially get into production. Um, so the good thing about helium is, is that you know, with, with one well, that may be sufficient to go into production, uh, certainly at this high concentration. Uh, whereas with mining, you, know, you could anticipate hundreds of holes being drilled before you'd have the confidence to go into production. Helium is, is quite the opposite, uh, is that you really, because it's small volume, because it's high value, you, you actually don't need to have that uh, larger production. And here it is, this is the flow chart. So when you go from identification, leasing, data acquisition, which is where we're at with our Greenland project, where we've identified that the helium is present, you then get onto a resource calculation and then drilling. Uh, so that could be exploratory of the appraisal well, which is where Topaz is, uh, Project in Minnesota. Then after that, you start to do reserve calculations, offtake discussions, and then eventually get into production. So that's really the roadmap to success and the steps that we need to go through to realize our project's full potential. These are our contact details. And to tell you what, what I'll do is I'll leave it there. And hopefully we have time for questions.
one from Carlos here. He's asking, your stock price has increased a lot recently, and and what's what's the upside still for for people who want to get in now? <laughs> uh, basically, we've just we haven't even completed phase one. We're still gathering data from the well, so I I I, I see there's a number of catalysts coming up. So there's the additional data from the well, the flow test, the pressure test uh, in the next few weeks, as I say. Uh, then the the resource update, uh, which will be significant for us. And then should all that look good, then we start to talk about production scenarios. So I, I'd like to say that I, I think it's just a bit just the beginning, Carlos. Good. Uh, next one from Paul P. Who's, uh, this is interesting. Who's, well, what are the regulatory challenges in helium extraction, transport, and storage that may constrain the revenue growth in the future, potentially? Okay, so regulatory. Uh, so at this moment in time, we've been regulated by the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, so they, they've been very good. They're the ones who monitor all of our exploration programs and make sure that we're adhering to the guidelines. Uh, we've also been dealing with the federal government, with the county as well, and so far the relationship's been magnificent, so we've had no problems there. Uh, but I also think that the, you know, going forward in the production scenario, the, the thing is the footprint's very small, and we're talking about uh, a commodity which is uh, inert. Uh, it doesn't have the footprint of mining and so on. So, look, we, we're not anticipating any, any great challenges, uh, but in terms of the, uh, you know, the transportation, once again, it's an inert, non-hazardous product. Uh, so, really, we're not anticipating there to be any problems, and we've seen with other helium companies as well, is that the, the, they haven't um, you know, come across any significant issues uh, when they've got to the production stage either. And this one coming from Yuan Liu from the other side is asking in general, is, is helium hard to find or hard to extract? <laughs> it is. Uh, it is. It's hard to find, but not hard to extract. So the, the production scenario is quite straightforward. The only consumable you have is electricity. The, the production facilities are existing. In fact, there's a company in Minnesota which manufactures the gold standard helium plants. So just down the road from us, which is very convenient. Uh, but uh, finding it is difficult uh, because people go out looking for oil and gas, not for helium. And so really you have to think about it in a sort of reverse fashion, but using similar uh, sort of uh, geological uh, sort of uh, techniques. But it, it appears to be limited really for primary helium to, to East Africa, uh, to North America and to Greenland. Uh, outside those locations, uh, really the geological conditions are not favorable. Sure. One last question for you. It's from Grace. He's asking, in terms of your if your uh, project going to production, will you sell it at helium spot price, or you, or is it uh, other price or off tick that you have to go through? We'd probably do a combination thereof. So uh, I think it'd be fair to say that we'd be looking at some offtake arrangements for longer term contracts. Uh, but should we be successful, then I, I think it'd be really nice to provide the market with a spot uh, market because that doesn't exist right now. It, it just doesn't. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult for people who have an immediate demand for product to actually get it. So should we be successful, I think it'd be wonderful uh, for the industry to be able to provide that spot market for the first time. It's something that we're aiming for. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for answering the questions. And thank you for your time here with us today. Always a pleasure, Gilbert. Thank you, mate.